Well, first of all, I'd like to like to ask you. You came out of a legal background, and uh, I'm, I'm curious how uh, how that prepared you for the world of museums. How did how did that how did that get you started? Well, I suppose lawyers are very much concerned about how to resolve problems and ro resolve issues, and obviously that's what human life is about, and museums are about human life and human ideas. I started out uh, in administration at the University of Iowa, and there were museums there, and then I came here, and so uh, I found it very challenging because there are so many human issues involved in a museum. What would you say when you came to the uh, when you came to the field? What was your vision for for the institution and what it should be doing? Well, I uh, did not bring a vision. I thought I would learn about the vision from the people who are here, and they were very good teachers. And then the question is what we could do together to uh, formulate a vision for new times and how we could uh, develop new means to be a worthwhile center of learning, and I think we've done that. We've tried very hard as a group to do that, so we've had a couple of strategic plans, but they've been basically developed by the entire staff, and I've been working with them, and so together we've come forward with the ideas that you now see in the museum. How would you describe those, those, those strategic plans in terms of, uh, are we talking about community outreach, or are we talking about the basic programming that you use in the museum? Well, I, I think two things. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, when I came, I said, uh, you know, this is a place of ideas. And everybody said, no, it's a place of objects. And uh, I said, but the objects of nature give rise to human ideas about nature, and human ideas give rise to uh, cultural objects, whether they are art, ceremonial, or technological. So this is a place of ideas based on objects. Uh, in our current s strategic plan, we talk about connecting, and we talk about the interconnections within nature, what is the environment, the total environment of nature. Then we talk about the interconnections in cultures, what are the cultural connections, and then we talk about the museum connecting with its community and how we can be ever more effective in serving the community of Chicago and the community of Illinois. We are talking about national and international, but uh, I always uh, quote that phrase either from uh, former Speaker O'Neill or the late Mayor Daley that all, if all politics are local, all museums are local. And to be great nationally and internationally, you have to be first and foremost uh, good at home and great at home serving your home constituency. So we look upon our home constituency as being our primary one. How is that expressed again in terms of the, uh, let's say, some of the exhibits I've seen out front today, like the, uh, the Senegal exhibit? Well, the Senegal exhibit is a very interesting one. It's an exhibit that's the introduction to Africa. And that exhibit was developed uh, with great community participation uh, throughout Chicago involving all cultures, uh, but very significantly, obviously, the uh, uh, African-American and the African communities in Chicago and trying to present Africa and the traditions of Africa that came to the United States through the eyes of Africans and African-Americans. You put a, a great stock in uh, community involvement. I, one of the gentlemen we were, we're going to talk to uh, has a lot to say about that. Um, was that a new direction for the field when you, when you came on board? Well, I don't think so. Traditionally, there's been a commitment to uh, reaching out, and this goes back uh, really to about 1911 when the uh, Harris Extension was created in the museum, which provided for us to take dioramas on a periodic basis to all the schools in Chicago. And so we've been building on that, and we've reached out in many ways to develop our exhibits. We built a Pawnee Earth Lodge in the 1970s and did that in consultation with the advisory committee at Pawnee from uh, Oklahoma and Nebraska. Mm -hmm. um, you did some work with focus groups in the African-American community. Yes. Uh, 
describe how those worked? Well, those groups were really uh, a variety of people and uh, involved a variety of people in a variety of locales. For example, one was conducted at the DuSable Museum of African American History. Another was conducted at the Art Institute of Chicago. Some of these were conducted on the street. And uh, to, to get an impression, particularly, uh, let's say, the uh, interviews on State Street from a great variety of Chicagoans, uh, what are your impressions of Africa? And uh, from that, we knew what we ought to be uh, focusing on in the exhibit. Now, uh, getting it pared down to a manageable size was an important thing to do. Now, at the same time, uh, what we did was to do an interdisciplinary exhibit that deals with what the environment, the physical environment is in Africa and how that infects the culture and vice versa, and then how uh, the uh, African culture came to uh, the Western Hemisphere, and particularly the United States, and the very positive and important impact it's had on American culture. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of feedback do you get from the community about, about this sort of um, this, this approach to uh, inclusiveness, bringing people in? Well, I think we get a very positive overall because, you know, one of the things is the more people get to know each other, the more they understand each other and respect each other. So what we're trying to do is bring people together. And we have no agenda except we're trying to uh, use these collections as an opportunity to talk about different cultures and really to try to understand why those cultures are as they are and what they mean to us. So that we tend to look at other cultures as being very different, and indeed they are, but they might be different as they deal with the same concerns that every other culture deals with. In, um, that, that leads me to a point you made in an essay on, uh, on caring as a duty to one's fellow human being. Um, it sounds like that theme uh, goes through a lot of your work, if not all of it here. Well, I, I think basically what we're trying to be is open-minded. Uh, too often we rush to be closed. And we are all captives of our own experiences, and our experiences tend to narrow us, so we're trying to keep it open so that people uh, can see new perspectives, develop new perspectives, but we don't tell them what they ought to be. Uh, we just try to encourage uh, the opportunity. When this happens, uh, you see walls come down, you see people opening up to one another. Uh, that's a wonderful uh, aspect of the museum. It is, and uh, we basically, the interesting thing about a museum as contrasted to a university where I came from is that a museum really should be a community center, and uh, uh, we don't have any prerequisites for coming in. You don't have to have graduated from a certain program. You need not have taken a certain course, but we want everybody to go away with a greater sense of appreciation and understanding about environments and cultures. And I might say, I think we're typical, there are uh, approximately 1,000 museums and historic sites in Illinois. Illinois is uh, rich in uh, museums and historic sites, and uh, these are basically cultural uh, centers of learning, community centers of learning, and when you come to visit somebody's town, wherever it is in Illinois, people show uh, newcomers, visitors, their uh, local museum, and we are a local museum. Oh, I Carbondale, so it, and I'm, I'm a history buff, so I love this. Yeah. This is fabulous. Um, think about some of the other aspects of the museum. There's a, a good deal of scientific research that goes on here. I also want to make sure that I get back to the dinosaur, the DNA to dinosaur exhibit. Um, that's another aspect of the museum. Uh, not only is it uh, a repository, a place where people can come and learn, but a place to do serious uh, scholarly work. Well, in that respect, it's unique. Uh, most colleges and universities in America started their science programs in the 19th century around cabinets of natural history. As things moved to molecular biology, uh, they did not focus as much on the collections. We have. Now what's happening is uh, we, are not, uh, we are using those collections in different ways, using uh, not only the systematic approach, but also the molecular approach, so that we have uh, basically biochemical laboratories 
in the museum which do DNA sequencing. In fact, uh, uh, a high school volunteer here in the Second World War in zoology went on to share the Nobel Prize for DNA, and so uh, as a result of his work, we are affected in how we now go about looking at environmental issues. That's another thing that I was going to ask about. You're, you're concerned about that as well, and uh, how does um, how does the museum express itself in those kinds of areas like the environment? And well, uh, it's interesting. We have collection environmental collections from all over the world. But again, first and foremost, we're local because our largest collection comes from Cook County and our second largest collection comes from the whole state of Illinois. And we are engaged in something called the Chicago Wilderness now with 35 other organizations in this area which are biologically oriented such as we or their advocacy groups such as uh, uh, conservation and environmental organizations, governmental organizations, and so forth. And interestingly, uh, in Cook County, because of the forest preserve, we have uh, more original land that's been untilled than other parts of the state. And indeed, the diversity here of uh, biological diversity of the plants and the uh, fauna uh, is considerable. So we are working here. At the same time, we work abroad, working and helping uh, other countries assess what they have, what kind of help them with decisions that they need to make about what they do in terms of development. And we're understanding clearly of the important needs for human uh, development, but to do it in a way that is uh, in the long range, long range going to be sensible and not just an immediate uh, economic gain that subsequently turns out to be an economic disadvantage, to say nothing of an environmental disadvantage. When you uh when you plan an exhibit like the DNA dinosaur exhibit, what do you want a, a person to come away with when when they walk through those doors and they start looking at obviously the uh, you know, the, uh, the fossils and everything and starting to learn more about how these creatures live? What do you want them to take away from a field experience? Well, I think we want them to come away with a sense of. Uh, scientific inquiry, that you want to look at things, you want to study them, you want to be open-minded, and that the range of thought is very considerable, and that the range of time is very considerable. And many people, because of uh, understandable uh, uh, presentations, Jurassic Park, a very exciting movie, but might come away thinking that there were people living at the time of dinosaurs, and there were no people living at the time of dinosaurs. And the Earth has a very long history and continues to change and evolve, and we are a part of that. There's also a certain measure of delight that you see uh, in the faces of people. Is that oh, yeah. Well, you know, one of the, uh, we want to motivate people to learn, and if they are happy and enjoying it, they will learn more. So what we try to do is to engage them, and we go beyond just having... Uh, row after row of, of uh, cases of objects, but try to use the objects and talk about the ideas that those objects generate, but basically to stimulate in people a sense of inquiry so that they can make up their own mind about what they have heard and what they have seen. We, we, we're not an advocacy group. We are basically a forum for ideas. I know that uh, my own museum is doing some work in having some aspects online so that uh, students at other universities and oh. other uh, high schools and the like can, can uh, find out more. We're really finding now that museums are, are places without walls. How is, how is, that, um, how is technology improving or increasing uh, access to the museum? Well, we have 20 million objects in this museum, and uh, to have access to them uh, for the most part, is uh, limited to scholars and to students working in the field. By computerization of the collection, you can make it accessible, uh, in a sense, uh, throughout Cook County or throughout the state or throughout the world. And that information is very important in terms of making decisions about what transpires. But as you gather that data together, you can work with it more rapidly. So, for example, for the last 18 years, we have been uh, studying the birds that have uh, struck McCormick Place in the migration. 
and seeing what has happened because as you come if you were a bird coming towards Chicago you would see this dark low underbrush it would seem to you if you were a bird it turns out to be a McCormick place so they fly into the windows we found a lot out about the migratory patterns of birds one in particular the woodcock uh, we find they are primarily uh, females and that they have made it south of here and they're going north in order to nest. Now we never could have done that without all the data and then being able to rapidly process it through computerization. Mm -hmm. um, and I might say parenthetically we have a worldwide website which has been cited nationally as an outstanding museum site and uh, we've had over 200,000 uh, uh, visits to that website in less than a year. I'll try to get, uh, try to get on that. Go ahead. Carpenter. Um, one more question about uh, where we seem to be heading. Um, where do you, how do you think technology will change the field, let's say, in the next 10 years as we head into the 21st century? Well, I, you know, there are two things. Technology is a tool. It's not an end in itself. And we talk about the information uh, revolution. Well. The real issue is what we're going to do with all that information because we can be inundated with it and flooded with it, but if we don't do anything with it, that's a different matter. So the question is it's a means to a greater end, but it's not an end in itself. So the, it certainly will play a major role in terms of uh, providing more information rapidly, and that's important. But then the questions are still human processing of the information that comes. The other thing that I find in a museum is that uh, I, I think that the computer really has become a very active uh, way of learning. Uh, we used to say when I was in the university that a lecture system was the most effective way of disseminating information, but it was a seminar which engaged people and it didn't get so much information out, but it stimulated people to work on problems. I think that one of the interesting things to me was that television never really uh, caught on as a means of instructional, uh, well, as an instructional method in the university, but the computer absolutely revolutionized instruction, and it's basically because you're not passive, you have to engage in it. And now the, the distance learning techniques bring computers and interactivity into the mix, and so you're, you're starting to see TV more in those aspects. Well, you do indeed, uh, certainly, uh, but you want to be able to interact. It's the interaction that the computer has brought to television and to the picture that's so important. But then there's the other interesting thing is that we are still social animals, and we still, uh, while we can learn much on our own and do learn a lot on our own in our lifetime, we still like to gather in groups and talk about things, and that's one of the uh, services of a museum, public museum, in terms of a community resource where the entire community, whatever their point of view, can come together and, and uh, you know, interact. You, you've done some work in that area, too, in the, uh, the future seminars that uh, took place on cable a few years back. Um, what, was, what, was the, uh, what was the intention behind that? Well, the intention behind that was uh, we were planning to have a World's Fair in 1992. And in 1893, there was a World Congress of Ideas held at the new building for the Art Institute. And one of the famous presentations was Frederick Jackson Turner's uh, talk about the end of the frontier. That is to say, the physical frontier was, in a sense, settled. And what was this going to be mean to the American psyche, uh, which had been so important? If you wanted to change, you went to new lands. That was no longer the case. So we wanted to have a World Congress of Ideas for uh, uh, 1992, and the future seminar were sort of pre-seminars to that. And uh, they were very stimulating. We had a lot of interesting people participate, and uh, cable television was a remarkable way of, of spreading that out throughout the state as well as through the city. Now, we didn't have the fair, but we have one of the legacies of the fair, and that is the rerouting of the Outer Drive to create a lakefront uh, great South uh, Lakeshore Front Park in Chicago, which will embrace uh, uh, the museums, uh, these three museums here, the Field Museum, the Shedd Aquarium, and the Adler Planetarium, the beach, the boaters, 
uh, Soldier Field and many other activities, but it will be a great lakefront park for generations to come. So we got the legacy without getting the fair. I like the, I, I do like the way it's all tied together here. Um, one thing I'd like to ask about with regard to, um, with regard to a couple of personal questions. What they uh, get on his way there. Um, you obviously, you look like you're having the time of your life here. With I am. It's, it's and I'm about to go on to a new career, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I always, when you speak about the seminars in the future, I, I, my f attitude that is, as long as you live, you've got a future, so you ought to take advantage of it as long as you can. Mm -hmm. What will you be doing? Well, I'm going to be helping the Field Museum on its uh, fundraising campaign, a major fundraising campaign to support the future activities that we have in mind. And then I'm also going to be teaching uh, about not-for-profit organizations and philanthropy. As a resident of the field, what, what's given you the greatest personal satisfaction from having stewardship of this place? Well, I think the thing that has given me the greatest satisfaction is the uh, enthusiasm of the staff for the museum and the increasing enthusiasm and involvement of the public. Um, in terms of uh, how would you describe the legacy that you're going to leave here? Well, I don't leave a legacy. I, uh, basically, people who I was a part of, uh, of a period here that I think was important, but it wasn't my legacy, it was everybody's legacy, and I think that that's the important issue is that it's the staff, it's also the volunteers. We could not operate this place without the volunteers who make so many of our programs possible, and then the generous supporters of the museum, and of course, uh, uh, ultimately, and first and foremost, would be the visitors we serve. Perhaps I could put it a different way. Um, what sort of uh, sense of values, I suppose, uh, guided the museum during this period? I think an open-mindedness to uh, new ways and, and a clear commitment to quality in everything we undertake, meaning that new ways are not necessarily uh, inferior in quality to old ways, and that through time you learn and new ways done right, you can stretch human uh, beings into new directions and uh, we can improve. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting to the end of my, my questions. Um, in terms of the, uh, the Lincoln Academy, I always ask each laureate about uh, their thoughts upon joining this, this body. Uh, there are some really stellar people in it. Uh, I'm fortunate to know several of them personally. Um, what, was the, what was your feeling when, uh, when you got word that uh, you were going to be honored? Well, I was uh, stunned because I do think it's an extraordinary honor. Obviously, first and foremost, because of the, uh, the honor uh, in the name of the person Abraham Lincoln, who stands out in American history, really stands out in human history as a unique figure of uh, responsive and involved in his times, uh, working with people, doing things. The second thing is that uh, clearly the other laureates have contributed so much in so many ways to uh, a better life in Illinois and around the world. I know there's a there's so much more I could ask you about, but um, is there anything that uh, you think that I haven't touched upon? That would be well, I just want to say that uh, uh, everybody in Illinois ought to uh, support their local museum because it is their local museum that reflects the, the traditions and the ideas and the futures of their communities. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. I hope that was okay. <laughs>